Welcome to this introduction to PROMIS. PROMIS stands for Patient Reported Outcome Measurement Information System. So PROMIS is a set of person-centered measures that look at three main domains, physical, mental, and social health function. This here is the About page on PROMIS at the healthmeasures.net website listed down below. And it's a great place to explore and understand more about PROMIS outcome measurement. PROMIS is distinctive in that it's created to be relevant across all conditions for the assessment of symptoms and functions. So in the past decade, patient-reported outcomes have become very prevalent in healthcare. PROMIS is an NIH-funded initiative that started in 2004. And the data behind PROMIS measures comes from large samples of community and clinical populations. So how many measures does PROMIS include? As of April 2017, 83 different PROMIS measures. And here are some examples. Global health, cognitive function, self-efficacy, fatigue, pain behavior and pain interference, physical function, sleep disturbance, ability to participate in social roles and activities, and social isolation. Here at this website is the full list of adult measures, all 83, which you can explore. So how do the PROMIS measures work? Well, each measure is a computer adaptive test, or a CAT. And a CAT selects each next question based on your response to the previous question. Typically, the first question asked is always the same question for a given measure regardless of who the patient is. But then the computer algorithm chooses the next item based on your response. Here on the left, we see the first question in the physical function measure of the PROMISE CAT. Does your health now limit you in doing two hours of physical labor? Should a patient answer quite a lot? That hones the next question down to are you able to do chores such as vacuuming or yard work? As questions progress, the cat hones in on your final score, and that score is normed to the general population. As you can see on the left, the respondent here ended with a score of 40 in a test with an average score of 50. Let's look at an example of me taking a promised cat for physical function. So I'm going to go to healthmeasures.net at that about page I told you about scroll on down, and I can click a link to try a Promise Cat demo. And here I'm going to check the physical function cat, enter my age and my gender, and we're off to the races. First question comes up, there's that two hours of physical labor, and for me, no limitation. So based off that, it next asks me, what about strenuous activities? I've been having some knee trouble, so I'm going to say very little. My health doesn't limit too much. So it asked me about how about hiking a couple of miles. No problem. How about vigorous activities like running? And that's been bothering me a little too. Hit next, and it's already honed in on my score, so let's look at my report here. Well, here are my demographics, and you can see as I scroll down just a touch that my cat score is a 55 with an average 50, and then it lists some percentages relative to various populations. So what about the score you receive once the CAT concludes? Well, the PROMIS score is a T-score. And what is a T-score? It's a score based on a distribution with a mean of 50 and a standard deviation of 10. The score provides you a measure of a given trait relative to a normed population, which in PROMISE is the general U.S. population. And the trait, in the case of the example we just looked at, is physical function. One of the beautiful things about T-scores is there's no floor or ceiling effect. Now let's consider the bank of items that a PROMISE cat can choose from. For the PROMISE physical function measure, which administers anywhere from 4 to 12 items to obtain the T-score, there are 165 items possible. Each of those 165 items is calibrated 
In other words, some fancy statistics have determined each item's relative difficulty, that is, for the trait of physical function in this case, as well as each item's ability to discriminate between two people who have different levels of physical function. And we can go to healthmeasures.net and see the whole bank of 165 items. Here I am at the search site, choose the adults, jump down here, choose physical health, and then look for the specific domain, which is physical function, the test we took. Scroll down here and search, chug, 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 and a whole list of things comes up. But what I'm really looking for is this. There it is, physical function. And you can see over on the right that that's a computer adaptive test item bank. So I click there, look at the measure, and here's what we get. All the items. And there are a lot. Not all promise measures have this many items. So I pointed out before that each of the items is calibrated. So here's our one moment of getting a bit technical. What is calibration? Well, each item is calibrated using item response theory, or IRT, which is using a probability model to predict the likelihood that a person with a given level of the trait, for example, the trait of physical function, will answer a certain way. Let's take an example item here. Are you able to run 10 miles? And there are five choices without difficulty all the way down to unable to do. And if we look over the left at the curves, we see that each of the item responses are matched with a curve of probability. When you look at the y-axis, if you look at probability, we have a probability of 0 to 1 possible. And then along the x-axis, we have the level of the trait of physical function, where the positive numbers move towards higher physical function, and the negative numbers move towards lower physical function. And as you can see, a person who has a lower trait of physical function is more likely to answer unable to do, the blue curve, or with much difficulty, the red curve. And you can see that each curve rises and falls as trait moves from low to high, such that people with a very high level of this trait would be most likely to answer with little difficulty, the purple curve, or without any difficulty, the pink curve. And each item has its own set of probability curves that reflect both difficulty and the ability to discriminate against different levels of trait. The cat uses this information to decide what item to ask next. So I want to share this video from the Health Measures website. Dr. Karen Cook at Northwestern University does an excellent job of describing CAT and how IRT works. Computer adaptive testing goes by its initials, so it's called CAT. You could say that item response theory is the math behind the CAT, and it's also which what gives me an excuse to use this great graphic. Computer adaptive testing starts with a bank of items. A bank of items is a collection of items that covers the entire range of the trait that you're interested in measuring. And all the items of that bank are calibrated to an item response theory model. That is, all the items have been modeled using IRT's probability equations. Let's use an easy example to explain how a cat works. Imagine that you want to measure physical function. There's a whole range of physical function from very low physical function to being at a high level athlete level. And you can picture a lot of different items that you could write that would target physical function. This is your item bank. What an IRT calibration does is order these items along the continuum from very low function to very high function. Once you have your items all calibrated, the cat can go to work. It starts by identifying the first item to administer to the respondent. Now, if you don't know anything about your respondent, then the best guess you could make is that he or she has a medium level of physical function. So the CAT algorithm goes, identifies an item that has a medium difficulty, and administers this first item to our respondent. 
But what if our respondent is a high-level athlete? In that case, she will answer this item in a way that indicates that she has higher than average function. So when the CAT algorithm goes in search of a second item to administer, it will take this into account and go pick out an item with higher difficulty. This process continues as the CAT algorithm narrows in on ever more precise estimate of the person's trait level. So a new item is administered, and then based on the person's response to that item, the CAT updates its estimate of the respondent's trait level. Then based on that updated estimate, the CAT goes and identifies the best next item to administer, the item that has the most information for that trait level. But let's say that our respondent is not a high-level athlete, but is someone with very low physical function. In that case, he's going to respond to that first item in a way that indicates that he is lower than average physical function. The CAT algorithm takes this into account and goes and finds an easier item. This item is administered, and the process continues just as before. After every response, the CAT's estimate of trait level is updated. And then based on the updated estimate, a new best item is picked. Notice what is accomplished here. The CAT has administered items that are tailored to the respondent. So hard items aren't given to the person with poor physical function, and easy items aren't given to people with excellent function. And even though these two respondents get different items, the IRT model is able to line them up on the same mathematical metric. After only a couple of items have been administered, the standard error of the CAT's estimate of the person's level of trait is pretty wide. After another item is administered, the standard error gets smaller. As more items are administered, the algorithm closes in on a reliable estimate of the person's trait level and the standard error tightens up. With a polytomous scale, after six or seven items, you often have a lot of information about the person's trait, trait level. That is, you have a very reliable estimate, one that has a very small standard error of measurement. The CAT algorithm continues until either A, a specified number of items have been administered. For instance, you might tell the CAT to administer seven items to everyone. Or B, the CAT algorithm can be program to continue until a specified standard error is reached, or you can use some combination of the two. The rules that tell the cat when to stop are aptly named. They're called stopping rules. This is a rare example of accessible psychometric terminology. When you think about it, testing someone or assessing someone using cat is a lot of trouble. It requires specialized software, it requires technical expertise, so it's fair to ask this question, why bother with it? Well, if you think of measurement efficiency as the precision that you get relative to the, to the number of items that are administered, the CAT algorithm maximizes this efficiency. That means the burden of responding to items is lessened. So you get less burden from one assessment, and that also makes room for measuring more domains. There's increasing realization of just how many psychosocial domains influence health outcomes. If you want to measure several of these, then it's important that you do so with as much efficiency as you can muster. So hopefully now you have a useful understanding of PROMISE computer adaptive testing. And there are significant advantages to PROMISE. For one, all the measures in PROMISE have been developed from existing tools and or items from those tools, with that work having begun in 2004. Additionally, the 2010 U.S. Census data included norming for many of these tools, which makes it very robust. The PROMISE measures are valid and reliable. And again, with the T-score, there's no floor or ceiling effect. Much of the work in more recent years has been to correlate existing outcome measures with corresponding PROMISE measures. The website listed down here, prosettastone.org, is where the linking of existing outcome measures with PROMISE measures can be explored and understood. So let's take a look. Here we are at the website, and this page is measures that are linked to PROMISE. So we'll scroll down here just a touch, go get a common one, the SF36. Click on there. 
and I'm looking for the linking table. And there it is. Click on that. And here's the table. You can see the left column up here has the SF36 score and its corresponding promised T-score. We see that it covers a range of T-scores from 24 up to 61. Now there's also some current work that is continuing related to PROMISE as it develops. As of April 2017, more and more existing outcome measures are being linked to PROMISE T-scores because there are a lot of existing or quote legacy outcome measures that PTs and other clinicians want to know how they link to PROMISE's universal T-score. Also, MCID and responsiveness to change research is evolving right now. And there is also work beginning on interpretation and clinical usefulness of the PROMISE. While the T-score is an easy number to obtain, it does not tell the clinicians much about a patient's capabilities. So, work has begun benchmarking specific items such that a clinician can reference a patient's T-score to likely responses for multiple measure items, even if the patient was not specifically asked those items when they did their PROMISE measure. The goal, again, is to help make PROMISE scores clinically useful. And that concludes this introduction to PROMISE.